A little bit more bad news before I try to move some good news, I'm afraid, but uh, a few more things to, to mop up. Second lecture, the title is simply The Road to Nowhere 2, True Life Among the Death Works, Christians and Contemporary Identity Culture. And in this moment of time, we live among the death works. It's probable that when you hear a statement like that, your mind goes quickly to the key life issues of our day, abortion and euthanasia. But while such things do constitute death works, the concept, as I want to use it this evening, is much broader, with these two obvious examples being symptomatic of a deeper phenomenon. And using the term death works, I'm taking my cue from the work of the great sociologist and Freud scholar, Philip Reif. It was Reif who in 1966 presented an analysis of what he dubbed psychological man in his prophetic classic, The Triumph of the Therapeutic. For Reif, culture is not what we now typically associate with that word. Usually I think we mean little more than the world of the arts or perhaps the general ethos of the place where we live. Reef defined culture more narrowly and specifically by that which society forbids and how it goes about maintaining such regulations. It is the behavior that society finds unacceptable that gives us our deepest insights into its culture. In fact, Reef, as one would expect from a Jewish Freud scholar, is a kind of Freudian. Civilization for him is constituted by what sexual practices it refuses to see as legitimate and which it therefore forbids and when necessary punishes. Given this background, Reef defines a death work as any act designed to overthrow the values of the established culture. These can be very obvious. Reef highlights the pornographic art of gay sadomasochist photographer Robert Mapplethorpe in promoting homosexuality. But more often, these death works can be unnoticed, mundane, daily actions of people as they go about their business. The girl who obtains an abortion, for example, or even the CEO who turns up to a board meeting wearing jeans and a polo neck rather than a suit and a tie. These two are involved in overthrowing the standards of the past and replacing them with something else, something antithetical. In our contemporary society, it's clear that the death works are in the ascendant. Sexual taboos are being demolished with a speed matched only by the insouciance with which it is done. I was commenting to somebody during the break, this is the first week that I noticed an article uh, in a British newspaper on bestiality that was not specifically condemning the practice, was profiling somebody who engages in this. Uh, even I had to draw the line on that as a topic I wish to write on for first things. I, I left it to one side. Perhaps only paedophilia still summons up horror in the popular mind, but beyond that, pretty much anything goes. Gay marriage has overturned millennia of tradition to the point where anyone holding to that tradition is now decried as a hate-filled bigot. Transgenderism has abolished the historic distinction of the sexes. Sexual ethics incre that increasingly depend solely on the criterion of consent have refashioned morality. The death works are all around us and have created what Reef would call an anti-culture, where the thing about history is that it is to be overcome. From the rebarbative language and pseudo-sophistication of post-colonial theory to the mindless adulation of youth, our culture seems committed to the idea that there is nothing in the past of real value to pass on to the next generation. <clears throat> the most obvious symptoms of this anti-historical impulse cluster around the sexual revolution. Take abortion, for example. The aborting of a baby is the erasure of the evidence of a sexual act. It severs the link between sexual intercourse and procreation by eliminating the consequences of the act. Indeed, the act has no consequences beyond the immediate pleasure which it once gave. An abortion also eliminates the future by cutting off the future life of the child even before parturition. To this we might add transgenderism. What is transgenderism viewed through this lens, but in one sense the repudiation not only of the universal cultural history on sex differences, but even of the history of one's own body. 
Fascinating the language that uh, those who've transitioned used about, you know, finding my real self, having lived a lie for all these years. In other words, their history was, was a false history. And now they're living in the truth. Robert George has pointed to the essentially Gnostic dimension of the rejection of the body's authority. That is correct. A Gnosticism in its rejection of the significance of the physical is also anti-historical too. Pornography, as I mentioned, plays its part. It is anti-historical to its core. One of the things which pornography does is divorce the sexual act from any real relationship. There is no true narrative which gives the acts depicted any significance beyond the immediate gratification which they intrinsically provide. In a sense, it is the perfect representation of an anti-historical age which is focused simply on the self-fulfillment of the sexually defined self. While it is too early perhaps to draw definite conclusions, <clears throat> evidence suggests that the rise in pornography use and its increasingly mainstream status has transformed popular sexual ethics and made matters such as homosexuality and transgenderism much more acceptable. If so, that makes, I think, perfect sense, both because of the range of sexual behaviours which it presents and because it detaches sex from historical context and consequences. So how are Christians to respond to these death works? Well, the first point I want to make is that a set of ideas or arguments is simply not going to suffice at this point. We are facing an anti-culture, not simply a bad idea which can be exposed as such and then replaced by a good idea on the basis of an agreed common discourse in the public square. As the anti-culture embraces all of life, so our response must be equally comprehensive. Therefore, the very first thing we need to do is have a correct understanding of the church in cultural terms. To make a mistake on this point will mean that all subsequent thinking on the matter of Christian life among the death works will inevitably be flawed. In fact, one of the errors that Christians make again and again is the failure that the church, to understand that the church is not to relate to culture, not in the usual sense of that word anyway. She is not the means by which God infiltrates the wider culture. She is not first and foremost a means of transforming, let alone redeeming the culture. Rather, the church is first and foremost a culture in and of herself. I'm speaking, of course, not in the usual way in which the language of culture is banded about, high and low, pop, etc., but rather in the kind of terms which Philip Reeve, T.S. Eliot and others use the term. The church embodies a set of beliefs and practices which regulate the community of faith, provide its members with their identity, and transmit that faith from one generation to the next. To put it in biblical terms, the church is the household of faith, and households are defined by relationships that manifest themselves in beliefs, this is my family, and behaviour, this is how members of the family relate to and interact with each other. Or to use Augustine's favourite terminology, she is the city of God, alive and well in the midst of the city of man, witnessing to and waiting for the establishment of the new Jerusalem at the end of time. Now it's important to note, I think, here and, that here and now, Christians are members of both cities. Most of us have bank loans, mortgages, jobs, etc. We are deeply embedded in the city of man, and there is nothing intrinsically wrong with that. It is part of life in a fallen world. Therefore, to say that the church is a culture in itself is not to advocate running up into the Appalachians and forming isolated ascetic communities. My friend Rod Dreher is continually accused of advocating that. I don't think he does, but he is accused of it with remarkable consistency. No, it does not mean that at all. The important point is this. The church is to be the Christian's primary fundamental culture, that which lies at the very foundation of their identity and which shapes how they relate to the wider culture. We are first and foremost sojourners and pilgrims in this world. Our citizenship is in the city of God. Our residency is in the city of man, but only for the time being. I'm a permanent resident, uh, but two weeks ago, the only important game taking place on that Sunday was England versus Italy in the Six Nations Rugby Club, whatever my neighbours in Philadelphia wish to tell me. Uh, my residency may be in Philadelphia, 
but the heart is back in the old country. <laughs> this point is grounded in the Christian doctrine of God. He is the creator of all things, both the first creation of the world and the new creation that is the church. I'm sorry, I can't resist with the Reverend Norris there mentioning last weekend's rugby result against the Welsh. Uh, I won't tell you what it was, but I will simply say that righteousness and truth prevailed. Uh, it is also grounded in the Christian doctrine of Christ. He is the head of the new creation, the church, and it is grounded in the Christian understanding of history. It will culminate in the new heavens and the new earth, with the church here and now being a foretaste of that consummation, albeit one that is highly flawed, internally conflicted, and outwardly contradicted. So what are the immediate practical implications of this? Well, let me quote the scholar Robert Wilkin. This is his uh, essay on the church's culture, which you can get from the First Things website. I heard him deliver it as a lecture at Princeton in 2003, and it was uh, profound as a lecture, and even more profound, I think, as an article. And here's a quotation. At this moment in the church's history in this country, and in the West more generally, it is less urgent to convince the alternative culture in which we live of the truth of Christ than it is for the church to tell itself its own story and to nurture its own life, the culture of the city of God, the Christian Republic, end quotation. Wilkins' point is well made. The first task of the church is to be the church, self-consciously to understand what she is. That, as he goes on to argue, requires moral and spiritual discipline, and that is where it becomes hard work, because we are not talking here simply about ideas. It is not a question of having better arguments than the world around us. Christianity is never less than doctrinal. Please don't hear me as saying doctrine is negotiable here. Christianity is never less than doctrinal, but the church is always more than a set of abstract ideas. It is a question of living life as Christians in this fallen world. There are a number of elements here. First, there is the teaching of the church, the doctrinal component, the proclamation of Jesus Christ, the crucified saviour, is central to the church's identity. It may look foolish or morally offensive to the world, but that is exactly how Paul indicated it would be in 1 Corinthians 1. No gospel message, no church. It's simply that simple. But there has to be more to it than that. One of the striking things about the USA is that the permissive society did not simply develop in opposition to the visible church. It actually developed within the visible church. I mentioned Patini's book uh, in the first lecture. He catalogues very carefully how Rogerian views of psychoanalysis first took root in the church before they came to have influence in wider society. It's easy to believe Christian truth in theory and to pursue death works in practice. This in itself should be a cause for deep concern on our part as Christians. Listen to the words of T.S. Eliot on culture. The reflection that we're what we believe is not merely what we formulate and subscribe to, but that behavior is also belief, and that even the most conscious and developed of us live also at the level on which belief and behavior cannot be distinguished is one that may, once we allow our imagination to play upon it, be very disconcerting. It gives an importance to our most trivial pursuits, to the occupation of our every minute, which we cannot contemplate long without the horror of nightmare." End quote. What Eliot offers as a general observation on the nature of culture reflects the more particular instance that we find in the Bible, the people of, of the people of God. There is to be a clear connection between the God in whom we believe, who we think we are, and how we subsequently behave. From the ancient Israelites loving the so sojourner because their God loved the sojourner, to the New Testament church as being recognizable because it is a community of love, the connection of doctrine to life is clear and the implications terrifying. The key to the church's culture is that truth and action go together. And while it would take a whole series of lectures to tease out the implications of this in detail, there are a few points which I would suggest are foundational. First, we should note that the primary locus for the church as culture is, of course, the church as gathered body or community. Cultures require time and space. 
And nothing has so indicated the collapse of the church as culture in the face of the death works of the anti-culture than the capitulation of her time to that of the world. Traditional Roman Catholics lament the loss of the liturgical cal Catholic calendar and the arrival of vigil masses, which allow for Sundays to be set free for fun. Confessional Anglicans and Lutherans have similar complaints about the collapse of the liturgical calendar amongst their churches. And many Reformed churches have all but abandoned the notion of the Lord's Day as something special as that which marks the rhythm of the week and inserts, as it were, a little bit of heavenly time into that of the world, where two services used to bookend the day. The tradition of the evening service is now the exception, not the rule. And where worship was the priority on Sunday, other pursuits have crowded the sacred out. Charles Taylor has argued persuasively, I believe, that choice is the hallmark of the secular mind. So when the church service becomes merely one option for Christians among many ways to spend time on a Sunday, then church culture has really become an element of the secular culture. Sacred time must also be properly ordered. The church as the new creation of God and as the vessel for salvation gathers not to be a social club, but for the means of grace. For a Protestant, that means hearing the Bible read and preached, celebrating the sacraments. It calls those gathered to respond by singing God's praise, praying to him and bringing tithes and offerings. Again, when these elements are traded severally or all together, for elements drawn from the wider culture around, then the church ceases to be a distinct culture and becomes merely the culture of the world expressed in a vaguely religious idiom. Love that article by, uh, by Rod Dreher, Keep Christianity Weird. Uh, it's kind of easier for him in the Eastern Orthodox Church to do that. Though in the OPC, we, we work pretty hard at keeping things weird, uh, as weird as we can. We should also note here that the gathering of the church in worship is the single greatest opportunity for cultivating an identity that is rooted not in the anti-historical ethos of the contemporary anti-culture. Historical narrative is critical to the self-understanding of the people of God. Now, much mischief has been done with forms of narrative theology that end up denying the significance of historical truth in favor of an emphasis on the literary forms of biblical narratives. But erroneous excesses should not blind us to the importance of those narratives. In Exodus 12, Moses points the people of Israel to a time when their children will not have personal memories of the Exodus and so will be puzzled by the ritual of the Passover. His advice is that they should tell their children the story of what happened in order to give the various ritual actions their true significance and their children their identity. I would suggest that this should lead to two emphases in corporate church life. First, an emphasis in preaching on narrative, not to the exclusion of doctrinal and didactic passages at all, but rather in a manner which presses on those gathered that they are part of a longer history that their doctrines make sense when set within that history, and that this history is to be foundational to their identity, and that precisely because this history is true, and not simply because their effect on the church community is a pragmatically desirable one. Second, the church service itself should be modeled in a way that underlines the importance of history. The use of creeds is one small way of reminding people that the faith is an historic one. I remember a few years ago giving a lecture on the use of creeds in services at a, uh, a Bible college in Northern Ireland and uh, a couple of students were very distressed at the thought of, of using uh, uh, unbiblical words in worship. And they said, we don't say the Apostles' Creed, that would be saying words that aren't in the Bible in worship. And I said, but do you sing hymns? They said, well, yeah, we sing hymns. I said, well, put the Apostles' Creed to music then, make it a hymn, do it that way. <laughs> uh, seems that it's the music you're objecting to, not the words here. Uh, <clears throat> The use of historic hymnody is also another such element. Not, again, I might add, to the exclusion of new and beautiful worship material. But a preponderance of what is sung should be that which is drawn from the rich tradition of hymnody, which we have inherited. And the overall structure of the service, I think, needs to reflect the history of the people of God, corporately and individually. Our fall, our redemption in Christ, our response to him in confession and praise. To see history is important to our identity requires that history be a fundamental part of both the form and content of worship. 
Both of these things, the centrality of historical narrative and historical sources in worship, challenge that fundamental death work of modern society, that of personhood as being constituted by my chosen inner self in this moment of the present. For setting me within history indicates to me that my identity is not ultimately for me to choose. It's sort of mundane, isn't it? But you know, for all of the problems around us, I think the solutions lie to some extent in getting our own stuff right at the start. To this, we might add a further element, one which is perhaps easy to understand, but very, very difficult to execute. Eliot's point that behavior is belief should strike a deep chord with the church. To say we believe one thing and yet to act in a contrary manner is incoherent. Now, as individuals, we are prone always to fall and sin. Christianity is predicated on that fact. But this does not mean that the church as a whole or as a gathered community should not seek to embody the kind of life which the New Testament presents as normative for the community of the people of God. Paul is remarkably intolerant of deviant teaching and deviant behavior when apparently sanctioned or at least ignored by the church. And this raises the specter again of the church's complicity in the anti-culture. Churches have played an ignoble role in the birth of the anti-culture. We noted in the first lecture that self-esteem teaching found its most receptive initial audiences among the religious, not just Jewish, uh, not just Christian religious, but also uh, the synagogues as well uh, were, were good receivers of Rogerian analysis in the 40s and 50s. To this, we might also add that the churches have collaborated in that most obvious recent manifestation of the anti-culture, the overthrowing of traditional marriage. The easy acceptance by the churches of no-fault divorce effectively transformed marriage in the church into a sentimental bond to be maintained only as long as was mutually desirable by the two parties, rather than a lifelong one flesh union to be severed only by death or by those circumstances which scripture outlines as legitimate for doing so, adultery, abandonment. Of course, to take a stand on this point is hard. Why shouldn't that adulterous couple just divorce their current partners, get married and carry on with their church attendance as if nothing significant has happened? Well, for the church to tolerate such means that the church has abandoned biblical teaching on marriage and on personhood in favor of the flexible morality of the therapeutic culture in which we live. So what should be done? Simple, church discipline. Now it is clear that the sheer variety of churches and the ease of mobility of this modern age means that discipline will rarely have one of its primary effects, that of bringing the offender to repentance. Escape is just too easy. But that does not mean that it should not be done, for discipline is primarily a function of what we believe not what we think the likely personal outcome for the offender will be. But discipline is rarely done because it is hard work, generally unpleasant and culturally distasteful. My wife and I had the privilege a few years ago of having dinner with Archbishop Chapu, the, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Philadelphia, who, if you follow any of the headlines, will know has fought a amazing struggle uh, in the Philadelphia Archdiocese against the permissive society. And I, I had said to him at some point in the dinner, I want to thank you for for the hard work you've done. And he turned to me and he laughed and said, uh, trust me, it's never hard to do the right thing. He said, it's merely tiring. <laughs> I thought it was an interesting way of putting it. It's merely tiring, sure. We, we know what should be done. Question is, do we have the energy to do it? Indeed, drawing from my own experience, I was involved in the past in a situation where a church member was an unrepentant serial adulterer. Eventually, he was excommunicated and his letter to me on hearing of the decision to excommunicate was fascinating. It was one for the ages, I would say. I'm not going to quote it here, quote it directly, but I can summarize it like this. How dare you act in practice in a manner consistent with that which you claim to believe in theory? <laughs> I was strangely encouraged by that. <laughs> uh, our orthopraxy was consistent with our orthodoxy. And that's what church culture is all about. We should not stress the negative, of course. The church's culture also involves the diaconal ministry of care for congregants and the community. 
But I think Philip Reef is fundamentally correct when he argues that cultures are defined above all by that which they do not allow, that which they forbid, by the beliefs and behaviours which they will not tolerate. And that makes church discipline a signal part of the church as culture. He used to say to, in, in dis- exam meeting discussion, say, the quality of a degree is defined by the best person who fails. It's a very British way of looking at it. Everybody has zero in Britain and you get points. I know when I came to America, everybody gets 100 and you knock points off. You may end up at the same place, but it's a very different outlook on grading. A degree is not defined by the weakest person who passes, but by the best person who fails. Same with culture. <clears throat> recovery then, moving on from the church, a recovery of the significance of personhood. Having argued that we cannot challenge the wider culture in which we live simply with ideas, but that we have to realise that the church is in and of itself a culture, I do want to suggest that there is an area of more strictly intellectual interest that the church needs to think about. Anthropology, or the understanding of what it means to be a human person. If the anti-culture is, as I argued in Lecture 1, predicated on a particular understanding of what it means to be a human person, so we need to clarify and deepen what we understand personhood to be. Fundamental to this is going to be reflection, I think, on the significance of the body. Human persons are embodied. We are not ethereal spirits to which bodies are attached as some kind of external appendage, or I'm a big fan of the police, if you've never heard of them, then you were probably born after 1970, I guess. Uh, their, their album named after the, uh, the Arthur uh, Kirstler book, A Ghost in the Machine. We're not ghosts in the machine. Now, to say we are embodied might seem like the ultimate banal truism. It would seem rather obvious after all. But attitudes to our embodiment lie at the heart, I think, of the modern anti-culture. From at least as far back as Descartes, there's been a tendency to prioritise the spirit and downplay the physical. Arguably, we could find this tendency in a different form back in the early church Gnostics. And some would argue it's always a danger for Christians when we have a notion of the soul that we might tend in that direction. And today, with the apotheosis of psychological man, we see its latest logical project in the rise of transgenderism. Transgenderism is, on one level, the latest iteration of ways of thinking that prioritise the mind over the body. It represents a rebellion against the authority of the body. It represents the subjugation of the body to psychological conviction. But other death work pathologies point to this issue too. Mention pornography, where the voyeur objectifies the participants and detaches sexual gratification from personal relationship. The hookup culture promoted by such things as Tinder, where the parties dehumanise each other in reducing the sexual encounter to a selfish transaction of personal pleasure. So the anti-body culture is all around us. Presumably, of course, we all intuitively understand that bodies are important. It is better to be physically with one's loved one than merely to speak to them on the phone or communicate by text. It is better to hold a beloved's hand than merely see them through the medium of a screen. So much human communication takes place not simply through speech, but through signals sent by facial expression, a glance or a hand gesture. Indeed, we have a term for such, body language. And scripture reflects this. Christ touching the leper is a powerful moment. Christ could have healed the leper with a word, but he touches him. It's a powerful moment. His glance, the look in his eye, is what convicts Peter of his sin. Physical interaction with others is important and constitutive of human relationships. Yet we live in an era where it's not just things like pornography and the hookup culture which are undermining the importance of the body for personhood. It is not uncommon to see couples sitting in restaurants and effectively ignoring each other's bodily presence as they send texts or Facebook messages to those who are absent from them. And we stand, of course, just at the very start of the technical revolution, which has brought all these things into being. Who knows where and how the revolution will end. In the meantime, part of the Christian culture has to demonstrate the importance and value of our physical existence in the face of the forces which militate against this. 
Our bodies are important because they are an integral part of what it means to be a person. We are not simply lumps of matter like a stone, nor are we simply organisms like a tree or a cat or an elephant. We are persons, thinking, reflecting agents, whose bodies are critical to that. Our embodied personhood is what connects us to our past, to our family line, to our parents, to our personal autobiographies, to the broader history that shapes our identity, and to other persons in the present. Indeed, if we think for a moment of Adam in the garden, his loneliness was solved when he was presented by God with the gift of another embodied person. Adam and Eve were bodies, complementary bodies, and this was vital to their interpersonal relationship, distinguishing them individually and as a couple from all other creatures on the face of the earth. Why do I emphasize this? Because so much of the anti-culture and its death works represent a denial of this. The sexual revolution is predicated on the denial of sexual, i.e. bodily, complementarity and on the assertion that my body first and foremost belongs to me as a possession to do with her as I like rather than as that which is me and therefore defines who I am. Pro-abortion ideology rejects the personhood of the child in the womb by repudiating the importance of the physical and those who reject the rights of those with Alzheimer's disease or born with mental disabilities do much the same. Personhood is for them easily separable from the idea of the body. Read some of Peter Singer's stuff on, on abortion. It's fascinating. You know, personhood for him begins way after birth and then somewhat arbitrarily. Now I suspect that Protestantism has an inherent tendency to be weak on this very point. For example, at the very heart of Protestant life is our appropriate emphasis on the word preached and on the declaratory extrinsic nature of justification. And these both carry with them a somewhat disembodied, if not abstract, quality. It's a point of contrast, I think, with Roman Catholicism. One can, for example, hear the word preached over the internet without ever being part of a congregation. Catholic, however, has to be physically present to take Mass. So what should Christians in general, especially those who might tend to downplay this aspect of embodiment, do in such times? Well, I would suggest Protestants need to develop an understanding of the significance of the body for our understanding of what it means to be human, our equivalent of that which we find, for example, in the work of John Paul II. What might a preliminary sketch of such a thing look like? First, I think we need to accept the bodies carry an intrinsic authority. They're not an appendage to us. Our identity is therefore not something we can simply devise for ourselves according to our fancy, precisely because our bodies are created by God and locate us in time and space. I cannot, for example, be a soldier in the Civil War because I was born over a hundred years after it ended. My body denies me that option. Nor can I be a Lithuanian jazz musician or a baboon or a slice of apple pie. My body has a decisive say in who I am. And no amount of psychological conviction that I am, say, a blonde woman called Gloria, and no amount of hormonal or surgical procedures that I inflict on myself will change the fact that I am a man and that every cell of my body has an X and a Y chromosome. Second, theology of the body will need to take into account the complementarity of male and female bodies as demonstrated in the act of marriage. Paul clearly sees sexual union as having peculiar importance precisely because of its physical bodily aspect. For a man to join his body to that of his wife has deep spiritual significance because it involves the physical union of two persons who are bodies. It is a unique, intimate act with far more importance than the passing physical gratification that it brings. It speaks of who the couple is in all places and at all times. On the dark side, that is why a man's sexual act with a prostitute is especially heinous. He is denying his wife's personhood and her unique personal relationship to himself in doing such a thing. To this we might add adultery. It is especially wicked, not simply because it involves the betrayal of a spouse. It's not just a breach of trust. 
It involves the betrayal of a spouse in a manner that denies the unique personal relationship that exists between husband and wife in the most definitive of ways, taking that unique personal act and extending it to another to whom it does not belong. This, of course, brings us back to the church's culture and the need for church discipline. I would also suggest that this should underpin our teaching of sexual morality in the church. If sex cannot be treated by the Christian simply as a recreational activity, then just as surely it cannot be taken as an isolated activity that happens to be hedged around with rules. Only after marriage, only between a married man and a woman, only between a husband and wife, etc., etc. It needs to be set in the context of understanding the theological significance of what it means to be persons who are bodies and made in the image of God. It strikes me that so much of the weakness in the Christian response to a matter such as gay marriage originates in our tendency to treat symptoms as if they were causes and to isolate marriage from our broader understanding of personhood and what it means to be human. Thus, for example, as soon as an unmarried Christian couple asks the question, how far can we go sexually before we get married, they're betraying the fact that they misunderstand the whole purpose of sex in the first place isolating the actions from the interpersonal relationship. Embodiment should also shape our thinking on singleness. The world of the death works clearly preaches from every billboard, sitcom and computer screen that human personhood is only truly fulfilled in sexual activity. That is the crass and crude legacy of the post-Freud world where genital pleasure, remember, is the most perfect form of happiness. It is also utterly reductive and indeed destructive of true personhood. Yes, true personhood is only fully realized in relationships and bodies are vitally important to such. But only the relationship between husband and wife is to be sexual. The love of a father for his children, of a sister for a brother, of a friend for another friend. All of these are to be honored and considered of tremendous dignity and worth. The church needs to take this seriously and cultivate a culture where friendship is given its appropriate due in making us truly human. The single person is not less human because she is celibate. And of course, when the church does this, it is likely that she will come closer to what Christ envisages in John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I think it's important to put on. Just as an aside, I think one of the places where the church can really make an impact in contemporary culture is friendship. Uh, we have, I was talking to somebody during the break, uh, uh, pointing me to a, a Ross Douthat op-ed in the New York Times uh, this week or last, looking to Japan and the, the incidence of loneliness among older people there and singleness and how this is leading to loneliness because people are growing old without families. Well, the church is to be a family. The church is a place that can provide these things and should provide these things. And certainly, it seems in Christ's vision, that would be utterly basic to the church. Next, a recovery of fallenness. Second strand of teaching which needs to be stressed is the innate fallenness of humanity. Since Rousseau, it has become a truism that human beings are born essentially okay and are messed up by society family, the class system, racial prejudice, etc. To follow this line has two obvious consequences. It ultimately absolves the individual of responsibility and it creates a culture of victimhood. There are obvious ways in which the church can affirm this and use it as a basis for taking cheap shots at the world, at the snowflake students, at the professionally outraged, at those who blame everyone and everything for their misfortunes except for themselves. But first of all, we need to realize that proper teaching on fallenness will have its primary impact within the church herself in promoting humility and confession. Take, for example, the recent spate of Christian Twitter and blog activity in praise of Rachel Den Hollander, the courageous woman who first came forward to expose Dr. Larry Nasser for the predatory pervert that he is, stunningly brave, I think to waive anonymity and to, to be the first person to, to blow the whistle on that man. Amazing. It was fascinating, though, to see how silent all the web noise fell and then even in some quarters turned against her when she pointed out in no uncertain terms 
how little support she'd received from her local church when she first decided to speak out. And that change was shocking. Seems to me that a far more appropriate attitude from the watching Christian public to her testimony would have been to resist the temptation immediately to co-opt her for our particular cause and then to examine our own hearts in relation to the matter and ask, is it I, Lord? Is it my church or my organisation that has also been guilty or delinquent over such situations? Point is simple. Belief in the fallenness of human nature should first and foremost shape the character of Christians and preclude at the outset the kind of triumphalist critique of the world which fails at the very outset to see our complicity in the problems we decry. I would also add here that an emphasis on fallenness will keep mortality before our eyes. I'd love to speak more about this, I don't have time. But one of the ironies of much of our modern culture is its denial of mortality. I actually think uh, I could make a case for saying a strand of transgenderism is an attempt to deny our mortality by asserting our sovereignty over our bodies. You can now pretend to be sovereign over yourself. Hey, you can have the body of the man and pretend to be a woman, denying your body's authority. But your body will be sovereign in the end, for your heart will cease to beat and thus rob you of any identity you care to have constructed for yourself in the meantime. Christianity can speak to that. It's interesting, I think, uh, the, the absence of death in Protestant circles is fascinating. Um, there are planning guidelines now that mean probably you know, when, you, when you find a site for a church, you're not going to get permission to have a graveyard next to it. I think that's a loss. I do think that walking past the grave of loved ones going to worship on a Sunday would give you a somewhat different view of Christian worship and of life. It's not coincidence that the early Christians would meet in catacombs, not to avoid persecution, but to be worshipping in the context where they're in the vicinity of the dead. Uh, mortality, I think, and consciousness of it is a very important part of Christianity and something that has been lost. Celebrations of life, what are they? Uh, you know, when my dad died 10 years ago, I don't want to celebrate his life, I want to mourn his death. To celebrate his life would have been a lie. I'd have been telling myself a lie. Christianity can be honest, I think, in a way that the wider culture cannot and will not at this point. Finally, my final point of the evening, asserting beauty. Finally, as a third area where I believe the church might fruitfully engage in deeper reflection, I would suggest the issue of beauty. Beauty is a tricky subject, of course, especially today when relativizing forces from postmodernism and pop culture can make any such talk sound elitist or simply subjective. But if my claims in my first lecture are correct, that much of the modern understanding of personhood and of ethics has been driven by aesthetics, not argument, if man is a poetical animal, as William Hazlitt claimed, and if entertainers are the unacknowledged legislators of our day, it behoves the church to take the matter of aesthetics and beauty very seriously. The anti-culture of death works ridicules beauty, just as it denies the significance of the body. Ugliness is glorified in everything from arts to human relationships, even as outward aesthetics are used to carry off the confidence trick. Think of the Oscar red carpet. Beauty reduced to the merely physical, hiding the ugliness of the countless affairs, abortions, broken marriages and damaged lives thereon represented. But the answer to worldly aesthetics is surely not a denial of the significance of aesthetics in the service of truth. The Bible itself is testimony, with its use of literary forms and genres, that poetry in the form of the psalm stood at the centre of Israel's praise is surely significant and something which should shape our thinking in the present. It's not the purpose of poetry to say things that mere prose cannot carry. Though Byron was very hard on Wordsworth, uh, the, he referred to him as the dull apostle of the northern school, who both by precept and example shows that prose is verse, and verse is merely prose. Uh, anyway, Protestantism, again, I think, is admittedly at something of a disadvantage compared to Roman Catholicism here. The concept of beauty is featured more frequently as a topic of theological reflection among theologians of the latter tradition. But Protestantism does have sources upon which it can draw and which it should try to develop. One recent and important attempt at this is Mark Mattis' excellent book, Martin Luther's Theology of Beauty. 
in which he takes Luther's emphasis on the crucified Christ as the foundation for an understanding of the Christian life that sets a cross-shaped beauty at its heart. And here is how he concludes the work. And I quote, God painfully tears down the castles sinners build so as to rebuild these sinners to be men and women of faith, people who rely on God and whose whole confidence is found in God. And that rebuilding project is one laden with beauty. The splendor of a righteousness established, not through one's own efforts or on one's own terms, but instead as a pure gift. God's righteousness is God's beauty. And it is the unique task of the preaching office to impart this beauty. Just cut out the quotation for a second there. How many preachers think of their task as that of imparting beauty? Isn't that a wonderful uh, model to hold in your mind? I go back to the quotation. The article of justification by grace alone through faith alone is not something other than or different from beauty, but instead articulates the core of what beauty most truly is. And even more importantly, frees and so beautifies sinners and reveals this good earth as beautiful. Thus God offers a world focused not only on tasks, but also on enjoyment, treasuring the gospel, but also treasuring innocent delights, such a song opened up by the gospel and being thankful for them." End quote. I would say this is almost irrelevant, not quite irrelevant as I'm saying, but I think the most beautiful lines occurring anywhere outside of scripture uh, thesis 27 of the Heidelberg Disputation. The love of God does not find, but creates that which is lovely to it. Great lines, like the back of what Mark is saying there. <clears throat> the idea of the gospel as beautiful and as leading to a view of life as beautiful is important. It calls on us to reorient our fundamental sense of beauty in terms of the cross. Of course, it needs to be fleshed out in concrete terms, theologically, liturgically, and practically. But merely setting the concept of beauty at the heart of the church's life and thought should surely cause us to start reorienting our thinking and building a community which should stand both in judgment on the ugliness of the world and paradoxically as attractive to the victims of the anti-culture of the death works precisely because of its antithesis to it. After all, what is more beautiful? The sight of some superannuated movie mogul parading on the red carpet with some synthetic starlet on his arm? Or that of the devoted wife of 50 years caring for a once strong but now terminally ill husband? Is it not beautiful to see the sacrificial love of a parent for a child with Downs? Is it not truly beautiful to witness true friendship, true celebration, true joy between people brought together by the gospel? Indeed, is not the cross and the life lived through and under it a beautiful thing? Let us not allow the temptation to despair at the city of man to prevent us from celebrating the gospel of Jesus Christ as it points us to the beautiful city of God. And that's where I wish to end. I've done little more than sketch out a number of aspects of what I think should be the church's response to our chaotic and strange times. We need to recover the idea of church's culture. We need to pay attention both to true doctrine and to the forms in which we give expression to that. We need to practice what we preach, or even, even or perhaps especially when that makes us look foolish or offensive to the wider world. We need to think long and hard about the significance of the fact that we who are made in God's image are bodies, bodily persons in this age where so many of the dominant ideologies deny the significance of that fact. And above all, we need to make sure that we are not simply reacting to the ugliness of the world around us. Christianity is beautiful. The gospel is beautiful. The cross is beautiful, even if it is in a way that the world does not understand. And the life we lead in and through Christ is to manifest that beauty in our corporate worship uh, and in our communities. If personhood is shaped by culture, then we need our notions of such to be shaped by the true culture, which is the church. And in so doing, we will also reflect the beauty of the God who, in and through Christ, calls the church into being. Thank you. <clears throat>